Welcome to the Trauma Informed Lens Podcast. Each week, Matt, Kurt, Jerry, and the occasional special guest explore how the trauma informed paradigm challenges traditional beliefs and approaches concerning a wide variety of areas. This podcast addresses psychological trauma in an educational manner and is not designed to replace mental health treatment. If anything in this podcast makes you feel uncomfortable or anxious, please talk to a mental health professional. Welcome, friends, to episode 43 of the Trauma Informed Lens podcast. Um, I'm Matt. I'm here with Kurt today. Uh, we think Jerry's uh, still uh, a- a- in Scotland, maybe golfing. Uh, so we're, we're excited to get the update from him. Uh, uh, but Kurt, Jerry, and I are going to explore a concept um, that led me about two, well, two and a half years ago now. Uh, to, to start a project that turned into the book Connecting Paradigms. And, and I, I know, uh, Kurt, we've had a lot of discussions uh, sort of about how we blend different philosophies, um, different approaches. Uh, we've got all these different best practices out there now. Um, and taking that on in a deep dive to try to create a cohesive, hopefully I achieve that, uh, a, a thing that looked like a book in the end. Uh, really made me realize uh, I may have benefited from this thinking earlier on in my career and especially when we look at uh, trauma because we're trying to a lot of times integrate the the trauma-informed lens or trauma-informed, trauma-sensitive, whatever you say into our existing uh, philosophical foundation. So I think there's a lot of uh, fun stuff for us to explore here uh, in this episode, and we wish Jerry uh, all the best uh, in Scotland uh, in his golf adventure. So for, for my bright shiny object of the week, I am uh, sort of fresh off my own trip uh, from Belize. Uh, and it's been a whirlwind. I was in Hawaii, I think about two and a half weeks ago. Uh, I, I got back, I flew out to Des Moines, Iowa to speak at a great HIV. Uh, a conference out there. So I want to say hi to our new friends in those two areas. And then uh, literally flew from Des Moines, Iowa, via Atlanta to uh, Belize for, uh, I think it was about nine days of uh, just exploring a beautiful and wonderful country. Uh, It's so cool to see such a different culture, a very small country of just a few hundred thousand people um, and, and a lot of rainforest <laughs> in there that there's not a whole lot of people living on. So uh, we got to spend a few days in Belize City uh, and got to really get a feel. Uh, we had a great local guide one day who uh, showed us around and, and just to be in a different culture. Um, that, that's so, you know, like us, they were an English colony, um, even though it was a very different history and didn't achieve. I thought this was fascinating independence until 1981. Um, so it's such a new country. Uh, we usually think of America as, as being new compared to like where Jerry is in Scotland, who Scotland has seemed to have been around ever since, you know, somebody with a pin drove up that far, or didn't drive up that far, but got that far and, and talked about the people there. And so um, very interesting thing, and you have this ancient Mayan culture there as well. So um, I, if, I, if I drift a little bit, uh, you probably won't notice the difference for, for most weeks, but uh, I'm on my like eighth time zone and I fly to Boston tomorrow. So um, I'm glad to be here with you, my friend. And uh, what's your bright, shiny object of the week? Well, I'm going uh, to give you, a, I'm going to use kind of a metaphor, which I think will help us think a little bit uh, about self-care and how to really, really dedicate yourself to self-care. So one of the fun things that I'm doing kind of fun, <laughs> fun at times <laughs> is, uh, is house shopping. Mm. So I'm out Exciting. Houses and, you know, doing all that stuff. And it's really fun to think about kind of where you want to be and envision things. And there's, you know, it's something so kind of enjoyable about that, that it, it is a fun function and a really great function of our frontal cortex. Yeah. Dan Gilbert says it best, I think, that one of the things that we have is because we have a frontal cortex, we have an experience simulator. Mm -hmm. We we don't have to go through everything to imagine what it would be like. And it can really help you to make some really good decisions. It can also trip you (laughs) up in some bad decisions, right? So that's fun. But I was noticing uh, as I go through this process that you get attached to all these different people in the process, right? So 
your my first one was a good friend of mine who's a mortgage broker and so i called him and said i think i'm ready and he comes back and he's like great and we got this and we got this and we got this and we got this and what do you think about these 10 things right and and then he wants to know what's happening with the process yeah. and he hands me off to a real estate agent and the real estate agent says great what do you think about this and what do you think about that and what do you think about this and then he has some needs that he needs to be updated on and then you start touring houses and you start understanding that the seller of this house has needs and i was kind of reflecting on that and going wait a minute <laughs> am i not i'm the one spending this money <laughs> but suddenly what i need gets lost in all of these other needs and yeah. I thought, what a great metaphor to being a part of the helping professions absolutely like that suddenly what you need and what you need to make sure that you're getting the value and why we picked being in this yeah needs to be one of the things that we're really really tied to I've, so i spent today with my real estate agent you know we saw i don't know eight houses today or something you know and the whole day right i was listening to him kind of tell me about everything he thought about this house and everything he thought about that house and everything about this house and i was just kind of like yeah i don't care I, I don't care if you like this or if you don't like that. I don't care if the seller wants this or they don't want that. Here's what I want. This is what I want it to be. And I, I thought it was a great metaphor, as it, as, you know, thinking about self-care. I love it. And that, that the reframe for me was, was great. It was a, probably a much more stressless, at least mitigated stress, an enjoyable experience to just look at everything and, and, and just go, yeah, I don't care. I, I don't like <laughs> that. I don't care if you don't like that. I like that. And that's what I want. And oh, exactly. <laughs> Resale, yeah, you just want to play it in yeah. a different oh, market. Like all so... of the different perspectives, and I'm just like, yeah. no, I got to take care of myself. Because exactly. I'm, yeah, I'm, you're the one that's got to live there eventually. The most important opinion here. Yeah. And that, that's hard for, I think, a lot of people in general to do. And I think yeah. particularly seems to be difficult for people in the helping professions to do because we got in it for for we find value in helping others absolutely and, and that part of that means putting your own needs aside so that you can be available to help someone else um, but there is a line that that can easily get crossed in in that where your your needs get lost so I, it was a reminder for me and i hope that it serves as a reminder for others that uh, we can easily lose our own needs and it's something to be really committed and dedicated to uh, absolutely yeah i, I had to uh keep reminding myself it's weird being you on your own doing and going on vacation but i uh, just for all the people i out there that i say you should not check your emails when you're on vacation i spent uh eight eight days solid off email and eight days solid off cnn and msnbc though it was it was a bad thing uh, i turned on the tv because i love looking at local television, whether I'm in the States or a different country, I just, the local access TV tells you so much about a community. And uh, I turn it on and Fox News is the first channel that comes up. And I just turned it back off. Yeah, for, yeah, like, cool. I, I got to switch hotels before I, I just can't, I just can't get past that. So uh, <laughs> yes, I, I did a fair, but I didn't check the email, which I was kind of proud of myself. So, uh, but yeah. I, I think that it's really cool. And we can kind of, I, I'm sure kind of weave some of these points together but um thinking about um what it's been a year since your book yeah uh that's uh i remember like when we were doing an episode about, yes. about the book coming out yeah um and it, it, what a what a great accomplishment and i mean congratulations to you i mean i can't i can't imagine putting all of all of my thoughts down into a, some kind of a coherent coherent product and the fact that you did that is is incredibly impressive to me so well thank you uh, yeah i would love to hear kind of what's it been like over the past year and like what are some of the reflections you've had as the book has come out and kind of gained a little traction and we've had the podcast kind of tie to it yeah it, it, it's been really interesting process to kind of be on the periphery of so i'd love to hear some of your thoughts well yeah it, it's really like a, a fun time to talk about this too because I, I saw my business uh when i when i jumped uh and started my own thing was uh july 1st was that and the book came out really just about uh uh, I had a training in uh, San Antonio where they got the first digital copies um, of the book. So, you know, this has been, you know, thinking 12 months ago, 
just kind of, even though the, the last few weeks have been like, I don't know where I'm waking up most of the time, uh, you know, a very different sort of disorientation than uh, uh, what this was like last year. And, and it was like, I, I don't know, it's hard to describe when, when you have to put, and the book turned out to be about 200 or so pages, a little more than that. But, you know, and, and I, I, I don't think I've said this story on the podcast. It was one of those things, I just woke up in the morning uh, and I had this idea, it's like, you know, we don't talk, I, I haven't read the book yet that talks about how we help people make behavioral change who are struggling with intense trauma, um, who haven't really been able to have that healing experience yet, or maybe still, whether they're maybe in a child welfare or a uh, juvenile justice or the adult systems homelessness, how do we help these people who we always ask to make changes, change when we know the neurobiology in many ways is set up uh, to be counterproductive to making big life changes because of that uh, consistent survival state that folks uh, find themselves in, and again, at, at no fault of their own. And so I was like, I woke up, and of course I wanted to write it that day. Like, I was like, okay, I got this idea. I can knock this out in, in just a, a few weeks, and it'll be done. Uh, of course, that was, that was ridiculous. Um, so, so I just realized, okay, I'm going to be realistic about this once I took a breath and realized I wasn't going to get it done by that afternoon, and just really started to do an hour before. Basically, I checked into my, my regular job at that time, and I just started to to really put down uh, using sort of cognitive behavioral therapy, but, but really motivational interviewing, which um, for those not familiar with it, it's a really great um, intervention to help people uh, really consider change. And we know best practice and evidence-based, uh, one of the best researched interventions uh, that there is out there. And I, I just really started to put these pieces together and, and found that you know, even though I talked about so much of this stuff, stages of change, neurobiology, epigenetics, obviously the, the trauma piece of it. Um, you know, one of the things that I realized, I, I didn't, I hadn't really put it all together in a succinct way. I think I put it together really nicely in chunks. So if you asked me to come out and do an MI training, I could give you a good one or two day MI training uh, same thing with, with the trauma piece or neurobiology. And, and it really sort of made me step back and, and sort of reflect on my career because um, I was trained as an eclectic therapist, which just in hindsight seemed like such a bad idea. And if you're not familiar with that term, um, sort of late, mid-90s uh, seemed to be when this was popular. But I, I had like a training in gestalt therapy. I had training in cognitive behavioral therapy. I had training a little bit even in like psychoanalysis and we studied young. And I could basically do so many things eh, maybe halfway decently. Um, but nobody in that class said, here's how you put all these together. And, and I kind of want to talk about that in this episode because I see this happening in schools where there's, you know, common core is kind of the big thing. Um, all, all these different uh, positive behavioral supports. Um, in the helping professions, we have motivation interviewing, but we also have a lot of the cognitive behavioral stuff, harm reduction we've talked about on this episode. Um, so all these different fields, we have all these philosophies and foundations uh, floating around. And it was one of the best professional exercises to go through for me personally was to try to make that all fit. Um, and hopefully, because a, a few people seem to buy the book each day, even though the audio books like surpass the print book now, which, which I find awesome because um, I love audio books. Um, but putting those pieces together, and, and when I was kind of thinking about putting this episode together too, and we were kind of talking back and forth. I know you came from a real, unlike me, uh, from my experience of you, is you got really well trained in, in a very specific and probably the most concrete form of interventions that we have with behavioralism. And, and I've watched you bring in much better than I did, especially early on um, before I wrote the book. You've, you've put these things like trauma and you do this almost every episode, which I, I just love. You put these other things um, sort of into your philosophy or maybe they complement your philosophy. 
And I just kind of, I would love to get your experience to somebody whose mind does this probably better than mine without having to write 200 page book on the subject. Uh, just sort of your experience kind of going from where you started with this really concrete philosophy and foundation uh, to being somebody who uh, can speak a lot of different philosophies and, and uh, treatment modalities at this point uh, in your career? Um, it's a, kind of a difficult question to answer because you have to go back a ways. Go back. I, 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 I about made this about interviewing you. So then this is you getting out of that podcast you didn't want to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think probably the simplest way to say how, at least at this point, the way that I, my brain kind of processes information from any perspective is one of, the, one of the things about the science of behavior that really just I gravitated, gravitated towards was to apply a natural science-based methodology to the study of human behavior. And, and, and we've kind of talked a little bit about the history of that, which this was a long time ago when this stuff was happening. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I think it's one of the things that I wish that I could wrap people's heads around who are not trained in behavior analysis. Mm -hmm. That behavior analysis really developed not because John Watson or B.F. Skinner many years later ever thought that emotions were not important. Neither one of them ever thought that. In fact, many, they have written many things about, I never thought that. I don't think that. <laughs> like over and over and over again, you see the interviews with B.F. Skinner and Noam Chomsky way, you know, way back. Yeah. Never thought that. Ever did they think that. What they thought was there were problems with the methodology that psychology as a field was using to study human behavior. And was really almost all theoretical at that time it was all based on it, 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 i mean it was interesting right you can see how when you when you read the history of it um how the methods the research methods got developed because they were interested in human experience yeah and that was considered to be the topic of the science of behavior was human experience All right so then there was a difference between behavior and internal experience Right. And they were trying to figure out what's like, where's the line between those things and how do we study this thing, which would be internal experience that only one person has access to. And so you have a problem with objectivity and objectivity is critical to good science. Now you have to have verifiable data and verifiable measures. And there are lots of ways that, that we do that now where we can, we can actually measure and objectively verify what happened within, this, with, within the skin. Mm -hmm. And that's where really good science comes from. And so that's how behavior analysis got started. That's what it was. It was never this kind of myth that Skinner and Watson thought that feelings don't matter. It, that, that is just completely untrue. And I keep hearing it over and over, and over, and over again, like, oh my goodness, if I hear this again, <laughs> oh, <laughs> kind of drives well, we, You know, from the counseling psych over the other building, we just, we crazy. looked at you playing with the rats. I just think like, you know, what are these guys doing messing around with these rats all day? <laughs> yeah. Their whole, their whole point was, and we're, again, we're talking 60 to 100 years ago. Yeah. Was that. Currently, at that, at that point, we did not have the technology to really see what was going on inside the skin. There was some pretty, there was, I mean, there's some real fun physiological research come, that, you know, back in, we go through the history of that field. Mm -hmm. They had, as they improved and that field improved its methods, then the, the sciences really are kind of coming together, right? We're getting good methodology. But even now you see things like, the research methods in cognitive psychology or the research methods that led to motivational interviewing and that led to a lot of these um, interventions and new philosophies. When you look at what their research methodology is, it came from Watson and Skinner. Mm -hmm. and it came from those ideas, those objectivity, measurability, making sure that you, everybody has access to the subject matter. Like all those things were very, very important. So that really drew me to um, this, this science of behavior. 
And then I had to go and learn. Probably I spent 10 years, if not a little bit longer, just learning that, like everything that I possibly could about it. And there's still many, many things that I don't know. I have forgotten much more than I have learned. Uh, but one of the things that I kind of pulled out of that study was that what was really important in any kind of field that you went into was to understand the relationship between physical events. And then so that's what the lens that I started to use to really listen to what other professions were saying. Right? And that's what I used to really decide whether or not what they were describing as an intervention or as a, as a philosophy, as a way of looking at the symptoms or the, or the phenomena that we were concerned with, really held water. Mm -hmm. Is it tied to what's the relationship between this physical event and that physical event? And, and, and that could be inside the skin, that could be outside the skin. I was like, I, fine. It, it can, either one is okay with me, as long as we can kind of distill it down to the relationship between physical events. Yeah. And, and that just helped me to have kind of a, a, a framework. Um, and when Jerry and I had to go around that for, you know, months. <laughs> So that I could get my head around the language he was using, yeah, and that he could get his head wrapped around the language I was using. Now he still, I think, I don't, I've never asked him this, but may, maybe he'll hear this. I don't know, but there were lots and lots of times where he would talk about a behavioral approach and say, "Well, like feelings matter, and it like we can't just have this approach that feelings don't matter." I'd be like, "I, I swear, I, I want to punch you in the throat." <laughs> <laughs> Like, stop saying it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's fascinating. And just like hearing you talk, I think one of the interesting things about psychology, and it's been fun to be part of this switch, but when I was in school, we didn't, we didn't I don't know, uh, we got a little bit about the brain, I'm sure, but it was kind of like, yeah, some of this stuff happens in the brain. Like, it wasn't anything we were in the decade of the brain at the time, but it hadn't hit uh, the, the textbook level at, at that point, much less the popular culture level. And, and it was just like, it, it fascinated me how we almost had to, you had to kind of pick, well, and, well, and this is more cognitive behavioral, do emotions cause thoughts? Do thoughts cause right. emotions? Right. And then you almost had to create this whole model based upon an assumption and then you know then put the behavioral test to it to see does this work um whereas i remember this one video you might have seen it but it was uh fritz pearl um oh was it no it wasn't young it was rogers it may have been a behavioralist as well but they put this poor woman through like three different distinct types of therapy um, of course, she came out saying she, she liked Gestalt because she felt more connected to the person, uh, which really meant nothing, um, you know, when you think back. But that's sort of how we measured it. It was all that it was. And I think qualitative research really has its place um, uh, in the research continuum. But, but it's like you almost had to create it and then you had to study it. And then, you know, we wanted to be so scientific that then you had to have the double blind studies and they made us go through all those God, I had so many freaking research classes in my graduate work. Um, and all I learned from is I never want to run a double blind study. But, but it's like we had to create these models. And I, I think that there is an analogy for uh, our, a lot of the helping profession here is we almost like look at everything and try our best. Um, and then recently we've had the quality movement where we then try to measure that um, but we're measuring something with so many moving variables and parts and outcomes that it's like, as a quali ex quality assurance director, I'm like, I, yeah, I can, I can measure it. I, can I tell you why we get that measure? You know, it's pretty tough. So, so it's kind of like we've almost just thrown this train together as it's been going along, along the tracks in an odd way. But, but again, I always saw behavioralism giving us it's like, okay, this works. We actually found something we could measure quantitatively that works. Now we have something to hold up, uh, the, then the cognitive behavioral therapy, and now all the trauma best practices as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, I talk 
and get a chance to talk to a lot of people kind of on, on either side of the eclectically trained versus the yeah. behavior analytically trained. And it's a pretty interesting time, I think, for all of these fields who are really kind of working together. And of course, I, I get um, oftentimes pulled into autism mm -hmm. um, because of the Surgeon General's report about effective, you know, treatment for children with autism and that uh, applied behavior analysis is really good for that. I mean, yeah. it, it really is good for it. Um, it also has some significant detractors and uh, people who don't like it. And uh, there's certainly the same issues with practitioner qualifications and variability across practitioners. Um, and uh, the same, same problems that every other, you know, field kind of has. Exactly. But there, there's getting to be uh, a lot of, of kind of colliding, I think, between, uh, I think the, the trauma world is a really great way to, to start thinking about some of the issues that people who are on the spectrum have mm -hmm. um, that are really pushing applied behavior analysis yeah. to adapt the methodology and, and, and there are people who are doing some really awesome work in, mm -hmm. in really, really complex um, skills and uh, uh, social interaction and, and nuanced um, interpretation of uh, like theory of mind things where you can infer somebody else's internal state and teaching that kind of a thing. Um, those are that getting on kind of the edge of those is really where some of the fun stuff happens. And there is this real challenge that I think that, that both, if we, if we arbitrarily divide it into two camps, I, which I don't know if that's fair or not, but. It makes uh, for a good podcast. I yeah, think. yeah. <laughs> Either side is kind of like in this position of, do I make sure that my profession and my philosophy, which is incredibly important, like on, the behavior analysts know that what they can do with a child with autism spectrum disorder and a lot of other disorders as well. I mean, I've been in the mental health field for, you know, like 15 years being a behavior analyst and the only one around for a long, a long ways in that, in that field. Um, it's important that the quality and the, the implementation integrity of those interventions be protected. Mm -hmm. That's an important thing. Like we need to have, if, if we're going to do evidence-based practices, which we should be doing, mm -hmm. um, integrity, treatment integrity is a big deal. And so you've got to protect that. And you don't want unqualified people doing your interventions. On the other hand, integration is incredibly important. And so you got to be able to talk to other people who might not understand the way that you're talking about your intervention and your philosophy. And you can pretty quickly start separating like oil and water a little bit and, yeah. and, and that becomes problematic for the patient. Mm -hmm. um, they, then they've got an issue with, they've got to hold the integration piece where we as professionals ought to be holding the integration piece and not kind of making our patients do that, our clients do that. Yeah. But, so it's an interesting dilemma that I think we find ourselves in. Yeah, and, and my, my, one of my questions that, that I, I'm, I'm thinking more and more about it, and I, again, the, the process of writing the book made me think just so, okay, how's stages of change? How's, you know, mindfulness? How's all this kind of connect? And, you know, the, the joke that I, I had, I had an editor, and, and when she got the first copy, and, and the subtitle is a trauma-informed and neurobiological approach to motivational and interviewing like she's like do you want to sell any books I, i'm like well i know like the eight people that will really want this book and that's like i didn't want to write what's already been written so it's like yeah. you know this was the idea i woke up when i woke up in the morning it was like to, to get this niche because there wasn't anything out there that i could buy on this niche and 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 the one thing that that i think in whether it's my trainings now really my thinking and i wonder if this bridges sort of this this gap that, that exists and also just to give voices that I ran a lot of programs without ever thinking about necessarily our philosophy that we were basing our rules guidelines policies and procedures on I will own that yeah. um, in hindsight I'm like what the heck was I thinking yeah. 
Um, probably because I, that's how I was trained as a therapist. Uh, just a whole bunch of throw things at the wall and see what sticks. Um, you know, the, the brain, uh, you know, that in many ways, even for trauma, you know, for me, the brain is what brought my understanding of trauma to a whole different level. When I, when I saw that there was a biological injury due to a traumatic experience, and then when I started to see the research on cha behavior and changing behavior means to some extent changing the physical structure of the brain or at least how the brain operates and then that changes the physical structure yeah. is that you know i've started to throw around and i'm sure i heard it from somewhere so i don't take credit for inventing the term but but brain literacy like I, i'm i'm getting to the point where i'm not sure we can be effective in helping people heal or change behavior without understanding neurobiology to some extent. I also think it's very important that we feel comfortable enough to teach others about their own neurobiology. And I just kind of wonder, you know, for, from, you know, knowing behavioralism sort of started out outside the skin for basically practical, because that's what we could at least measure. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of wonder how the, the growing understanding, because I know we consume a lot of the same books, um with this and i think this gives us the shared language as well to build all these great conversations i love having how has the neurobiology piece uh changed your thinking from maybe let, let's say you know 18 years ago or whenever when you started thinking about this stuff before we had a lot of this information yeah when i was a undergraduate um i had a, a really kind of formative professor whose his name was carl cheney and Carl had been a professor at Utah State when I met him for 33 years. Um, and he knew B.F. Skinner. Mm. <laughs> actually, he actually took me and, 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 and took me to, to uh, Skinner's home, to the annual B.F. Skinner Foundation annual cocktail party. The pilgrimage. <laughs> <laughs> it was awesome. I had such a great time. Yeah. I, I met Julie Vargas and Ernie Vargas, who is wow. Skinner's daughter yeah. and son-in-law. Um, I met his granddaughter who lived in the house at that, at that time. And well, you know, Carl was just this, this wonderful guy. And he was a professor, not only in the behavior analytic courses, mm -hmm. it was my first course in behavior analysis, but Carl was also a professor of the neurobiology courses. Mm. So I took them. Yeah. Right? So I took physiological psychology from the same professor who taught me behavior analysis. Cool. Right. And so when it, it go, going back to that point of the relationship between physical events, right, physiological psychology was all relationship between physical events. They were just what we knew about what happened inside the skin. And mm -hmm. right? so there was a lot of that that was learning the anatomy, you know, the structures. And then there was a part of it that was learning the functions. And that was relationship between physical events which matched right on to what i was learning about environment behavior relations mm -hmm. and that kind of sat for me in a little bit of a compartmentalized way um, for a lot of years and my exposure then to uh the the trauma field that made so much sense to me was the brain and physiology because I had learned that. I mean, I took courses in graduate school and you know, was sitting around learning about the, the anatomy of, of the brain and of the stress response. And uh, I took uh, courses in, in uh, neuroimmunology, which was really cool. And so I had gotten a lot of that information and I had started to really see a lot of the application there was in classical conditioning or respondent conditioning, because we could really study the underlying physiological mechanisms related to classical conditioning. A little bit harder to study it for operant conditioning. You could take a drink because we take said- Take a opera. drink. <laughs> <laughs> like two podcasts in a row now. I know. <laughs> so when we started to put the neurobiology onto what we were seeing with things like attachment, Mm -hmm. or what we were seeing with what how that related to state dependent changes in behavioral responses 
that just kind of integrated all of those things for me that have been kind of just marinating for a lot of years, you know? Um, and, and once I kind of got that, um, then I became for, I'd say for five years, I read everything that I could get my hands on primary literature, non-primary literature. I just read and read and read and, until I had kind of distilled this, that's where this idea of inside the skin versus outside the skin mm. even came from. Yeah. It was a way to be able to talk to uh, both people trained in applied behavior analysis and people not trained in applied behavior analysis. Because all the people who are eclectically trained, we'll put them all into that group, were super interested in what was going on inside the skin and super interested in creating hypotheses about what was happening inside the skin. And that will drive behavior analysts crazy. It'll drive us nuts it's because so much of it is not based on actual relationships between physical events. Yeah. Right? But it's on the edges of the things where creativity really kind of happens. So it's not bad that we go to those edges. Yeah. But it's also, you just have to realize that you're on the edge, right? <laughs> it's a good thing about getting there. It's just that you got to realize that you're on a little bit shaky ground out there. And, and I needed to be, have a way of talking to the, the behavior analytically trained colleagues of mine, because I was interacting with them a lot at the same time that I was interacting with non-behaviorally trained people. And I needed to have a way to talk to them that wouldn't get them to just tune me out and not listen to me. Yeah. So that's kind of where we got these words of, that's a, that's a symptom that's happening inside the skin. What do we know about what happens inside the skin? Or that's a symptom that's happening outside the skin. What do we know about how that's interacting with the environment? It was a way of integrating those two things together. Great. Uh, which was super fun. It was, it was yeah. enjoyable to, to go through that process. So, so I would love to get your take on this because, you know, again, one of the things I've, I've already admitted on this podcast is, and again, maybe because my training was like this, is that we get so, and most of us jump into a program that already exists. And I, I think it took me a while. And really, I think the trauma and actually working for Jerry, where he had this philosophy, made me start to think about, okay, what, what is the philosophy and or science that we're basing this program off of? And you know, I, I think we're doing a great job now, especially, you know, I, I think, again, uh, healthcare, you know, is, is medical health, mental health. We're starting to get to that understanding, I think, more and more of in, integrating all, all of health and well-being, um, sort of at least under one roof. But even if you put that all in a, let's just say, whether that's a school setting, whether that's a federally qualified health center, I, I, I'm, I'm, assuming here that probably the vast majority of people, though our audience is, of course, a lot smarter than the typical audience, but, you know, if, if a lot of people are probably like me and may not have had those conversations with their peers and leadership is, okay, what is our foundation to build our interventions off of? Um, a lot of times, and this is where I think as a therapist, we, we kind of own the therapy part of it, whether that's cognitive behavioral therapy or, you know, whatever EMDR or whatever that is. I, you know, if you, the, the health centers uh, that I work with, then you have the, the medical model that, that's really heavy. And then you throw a bunch of social workers in the mix who, who look at it from, and then they, you got the micro and the macro social workers with different levels of training. And, and I think in some ways, and I've seen this a lot in like child welfare and other child services, Sometimes you throw criminal justice in there as well. And we just kind of throw it all together and hope that it, it makes sense in some ways. And I think a lot of times historically, it hasn't made a whole lot of sense. Um, and so, you know, uh, you know as, as we were planning for this, it's like, okay, what if you were talking to somebody as, again, somebody who thinks about this, and I know a uh, programmatic leadership perspective too, Let's say a program's been operating w without having these discussions about philosophy, foundations, uh, what, are we, what are we doing, why are we doing it sort of thing. Do, do you have any suggestions of how people might at least start to have that conversation? You, you definitely. I definitely <laughs> talked about that. And I think the first 
thought that I have to share is to understand that there is a big difference between a philosophy and an evidence-based practice. Yeah. Big Talk about that a little bit. There. Big difference. So a lot of people, when they design programs, tend to want to tie it to an evidence-based practice. Mm-hmm. That's not bad. That's a yeah. good thing. It's a very good thing. But an evidence-based practice isn't usually your philosophy. Mm-hmm. Right? An evidence-based practice is called that because it's gone through enough testing to be uh, shown to be effective for a particular problem area for a particular population of people. And that's really how it became an evidence-based practice. Now there are practices like dialectical behavior therapy, motivational interviewing, right? There's tiers of Mm -hmm. evidence-based practices in terms of what's been effective for a wider variety of people. And so that can be a way to kind of, for people to select you know, what are the evidence-based practices that we're going to do? Mm-hmm. But that's not, just, in general, that's not a philosophy. I mean, it's too narrow to be considered a philosophy. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I do is create a model around uh, information gathering and decision-making. And that's my philosophy. Yeah. My evidence-based practices fit into that philosophy. Right. And so I, I went to a great talk. This comes out of a talk I went to actually at the Association for Behavior Analysis International a few years ago. And it was given by, I went to it really because I was interested in the title and one of the presenters was one of my professors from Utah State University years ago, a guy named Tim Slocum. Uh, If anybody gets a chance to study under Tim Slocum, do it, he's wonderful. (laughs) Um, And Tim gave this great talk where he he said, there are evidence-based practices, which are, as I said, research to be demonstrated to be effective for a particular diagnosis or problem area for a particular population or set of populations. And then he said, then there's this other thing that is the evidence-based practice of mental health care or of healthcare systems in, in general. Right. And, and I perked up, I was like, oh, I'm getting, like, I loved what he was saying, right. I, I, I'm getting it. And so I, I developed a model that is the evidence-based practice is that you practice with the best information available to you. And you use that information and filter it through a lens through which you're trained, right? That can, you can be trained in a variety of different ways mm-hmm. and you, whatever information you get, you're viewing it through a certain personal lens. So that, that goes into then making decisions and, de- and developing hypotheses about why this symptom is happening or why this problem is occurring. And so we gather information, we view it through certain lens, we go, here's why I think this is happening. Mm-hmm. And so I'm going to pick this evidence-based practice to address this problem that, because I think it's happening for this reason. And then you implement that intervention, you get information about whether or not that intervention is effective or not. So you have new information to feed into the best information available. Mm-hmm. And you go through the cycle again. Kind of the quality so, cycle at that yeah. point in some ways. So yeah. That's a, that's, kind of a model around decision-making and information gathering that allows you to be flexible enough to use the evidence-based practices for the problems that you get in your program. Right. Yeah, and I think that, you know, again, stepping in um, both as a consultant and also as an employee into that quality facilitation role, you know, I, I, I basically follow that, that roadmap that you just said is, you know, you try to take something that has worked for other people in some ways to really simplify that. But there's evidence that, again, this works with this population. And then, you know, measure is this working to get to your goal, so to speak. And that, I think, you know, maybe the only language I add, because I think you really did it well, is, you know, I, the question is, okay, what's our goal? What, what's a goal for a health center? When somebody walks through the door, and that goal is probably going to be individualized to some ex- extent as treatment is as well, but, but trying to like, okay, how do we be- best reach that goal and bring those pieces in? How do we measure our progress towards that goal, which was where the quality comes in? And then realizing, you know, I, I think I, I'm always humbled by the fact that the more complex, the, the complexity we now we understand about the brain is that each patient, each student, each client, whatever label we put on them that walks through our door comes in with a different neurobiology. It's not like we build one bridge 
And then we can build that bridge just with little adjustments all over the country or the world. It's like, okay, we got to, you know, create the relationship attachment styles. There's all these variables uh, in our work that I don't think we give, we don't get enough credit for. And I, I think a lot of times we don't appreciate um, the brilliance that needs to happen on many levels. Cause even like MI, which is a, can be a very, I don't, I wouldn't say regimented because there's a flexibility to it, which is why I think it is the best practice, but it's like, okay, do this now and do this now. And if they're in this stage of change, do this, but you know, then you realize people are going through 12 major life changes at the same time. And so, you know, it's just that, that, that complexity of all of this, uh, uh, makes to me this is some of the most fascinating, challenging work you could possibly do. And then, as somebody who's trying to measure the quality of that work, it's like you know, put me in a manufacturing plant, and I would be a quality guru. Tell me to measure the effectiveness of a federally qualified health center on the overall well-being of their patients, and boy, you're, you're working with a such different starting point and a such different ending point that it's. Yeah, to me, it's just a fascinating piece. And the other thing that I, I've, uh, to add to what you said that I really uh, thought is, is I, and this is more of a wonder kind of o open question if you have any thoughts about too, is, you know, when, when I look at things like motivational interviewing, I think one of the things that they brought to the cognitive behavioral arena, and again, not knowing the full history, I was trained in cognitive behavioral therapy, probably more so than anything else um, in grad school, is what they call the spirit of motivational interviewing. So they give this underlying philosophy and, and harm reduction is the other one that I think is somewhat fascinating for this discussion because it almost came out of a philosophy is that we, we don't know what's gonna work with, you know, people struggling with addictions to heroin because it seems so overwhelmingly devastating. Uh, we have no idea how to help with the HIV crisis. And so this different kind of philosophy popped up that then things like needle exchange and, you know, other programs evolved from. So, you know, harm reduction is interesting because it was almost a philosophy that became a practice um, or at least intervention. So, you know, when you were saying that, I was like, you know, I wonder if some of these are best practices to some extent because they had that deeper level of thinking about, okay, what's the philosophical foundation that we build these skill sets or approaches yeah. off of? You know, one of the things that I appreciate about harm reduction is it is incredibly data-driven. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's kind of, for me, that's the bedrock yeah. of it. Or it ain't harm reduction if it's not, right? If it actually does not reduce harm, which you have to have hard data to tell you whether or not that happened. Yeah. It's not harm reduction. Yeah. So I appreciate about that, right? Because it's a it's a loop basically mm -hmm. of going, maybe if we tried this, it would result in fewer people overdosing on heroin. Let's try it out and see what happens. Do fewer people overdose? Yeah, good. Then it's harm reduction. Yes. Great. Let's go through it again. So that's something I really appreciate about that model. Uh and and I, I just appreciate the 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 ability to double check on whether or not what your intervention and what your practice is doing, whether or not it's working or not. Yeah, even absolutely. right down to one of the coaching that I would give to new clinicians a lot is as simple as asking their clients at the end of a session, how did today go? Yeah. <laughs> like, did I did I ask the right questions? Was this okay for you? Like, I, I, even yeah. rate rate me anonymously. Yep. Totally great. I can adjust that way. Exactly. Um, and I think those are really really important things to build into both our practices, like our evidence-based practices, um, and the evidence-based practice that we, that we all engage in, regardless of what evidence-based practice you use. Absolutely. But I like those processes a lot, and I think they're, they're you know, tied to back to a great philosophy, at least of a value within a philosophy, which it really is curiosity. Uh, I know I've mentioned that a lot on our podcast, and I think it's one of those just critical characteristics of a good therapist, a good human services provider is the ability to remain curious yeah. and keep asking questions and wondering how things are going and soliciting feedback. Uh, I think those are all just critical, critical practices to do. And it's a, a critical characteristic to hang on to.
Uh, absolutely. And, and the, the final thing, I got one more question I'd love for us to tackle, but the, the one thing I think we, we need in all these deeper discussions about this, and again, I, I think harm reduction, uh, again, gave, gave me when I was exposed to it, I, I just saw there was so much brilliance there. And then, you know, again, we see the, the real quantitative data coming out of systems who use that approach uh, to their work is, you know, this was really designed by people needing help. It wasn't designed by a bunch of, you know, people in, in universities necessarily. It really came from the streets. It's like, hey, this is what we need, right? We want to get sober, but we can't get sober to get in your program. So what about us? And, you know, th there were these great movements in Europe and then the U.S. And again, the, the crisis of some of these movements is like, you guys are not giving us what we need. So let's try this. And again, I just love, it's just a reminder to me as you're having some of these discussions internally, if appropriate, because I know it doesn't work in, in all settings, but I, I would argue it does the majority. Make sure you get, like you just, you, the example, get client input on this too. Um, I think sometimes we miss that as we get more and more kind of academic about stuff is, you know, some of our best approaches didn't didn't happen in the classroom. They they came off the streets. And well, we know we know that we can always get you excited about a good grassroots movement. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, so my final question, and you can kick this one back to me if you don't have anything right off the top of your head. But as we talked about again, my experience of now I have the neurobiology. I can build a trauma onto that, the MI onto that, at least as a knowledge scientific base. Um, to, to really help me understand the best practices and then when to bring those in as interventions in certain situations. Um, and uh, I think the other thing, when you were talking about that process, um, it's almost, it mirrors a case consultation process too, is how do you work with the individual there as well? So making sure we have that flexibility, which is, again is also tricky when all the best practices want you to implement A, B, C, D, E, and my, my favorite word is fidelity in some ways because it's just such a joke in other ways because hard to do yeah it would be great if the person shows up for therapy uh but they only show up once a month right. and yeah good good luck with going a b c and d in that way being flexible but remaining true as true as you can to exactly the practice is is a kind of an art form it is absolutely and where do you kind of think we're going with all of this? We, we've had the quality movement. We, we've got the neuroscience evolving. Um, I think we're thinking inside, outside skin, maybe not as deeply as we talk about, but, but I, you know, I, you know, nobody's come up to me and, and I, you know, from the psychology world, sort of my peeps and said, boy, this Kirk guy's crazy, right? He doesn't get us at all. I mean, there's, there's this evolving language of this so so if we're just gonna have fun with the last you know few minutes of the episode take us down maybe 20 years from now when, when we're kind of old guys on episode number 4030 what do you I, where do you I, think i have no idea where things are going. <laughs> well i have some thoughts about where i would like to go where would you like to go? Uh, I have, and, and I don't know if the. Field I agree. I, as a therapist, I can give you the uh, magic wand question. Uh, yeah, if I, I gave Kurt a magic wand, how would he change the future? There are a couple of things that I am really, really interested in, and and, and there's some certainly direction that you you can see going this way of incorporating biometrics mm -hmm. and and behavioral measurement uh, in correlating the two things. And so I think that's going to be, I would love to get, I mean, I've been using heart rate for a while now. Um, and the ability to use some data, some hard data, right, on a, on a heart rate and use it in a way to stay connected to a patient and make sure that you're looking at a measure, actually, that is completely outside their skin now because we have it as a number on a wristwatch or on your smartphone. Yeah. That is a measure of their internal state mm -hmm. and a way to occasion you really prompt you to ask what's going on with you. Yeah. Like that's such a great component of a therapeutic interaction. 
Yeah. And it's a critical component of it. And it's a great way to use some data that you can then use to track progress. Mm -hmm. All right. So you get a nice match between those things. And um, I hope that the field will continue to go that direction. I don't see a lot of reasons why it wouldn't continue that way. Um, I'm certainly have every intention and plan of making that be a part of what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. okay, I'll make my contribution to the field going that direction in, in whatever sphere of influence I have. Uh, but that's what, something I see that will be incredibly uh, powerful, I think, as it gets, we get better at it. Yeah. What do you think? And, well, my, mine is, is somewhat related to that, though, though I'm going to go a little bit more sci-fi uh, on you, but I, I think we're talking about the same thing. I'm really fascinated by, by a couple of concepts that are evolving, and I'm not sure they're ever going to, to give us what we hope they give us, but, but it's that, that there's this concept in neurobiology now that we each have what's called a connectome, which is basically how the neurons connect and function to one another. And, and the theory with some, some really good science behind it, though I think the complexity, you can push this out may, maybe even longer. There are technologies evolving rapidly too, is that if we could, as a therapist who really, you know, the, the, the brain has become so central to my thinking, I, I never get to see the organ I'm trying to help work with. And I think, even for me, it may not be as important for me to see it, but imagine somebody kind of seeing their trauma show up in their neurobiology, uh, their habits showing up in their neurobiology. So while, while you, as you normally do, hit a practical, achievable sort, sort of uh, a balance with this, I, I sort of wonder is, you know, wearable brain technology that you can spend a couple hundred bucks and get a pretty cool stuff off of Amazon right now. Biofeedback, <laughs> yeah. you know, heart rate sort of plus stuff. And as that becomes, you know, think about if, if you're kind of our age, think 20 years back, would you ever imagine a Fitbit? Like, would you, you know, would you ever imagine if, I mean, if we were doing heart rate studies, we'd probably be taking people's pulse as they're, you know, having a, uh, a blow up at us. You know, if, if we can, as, a, and as our understanding of all this achieves, is get that connect dome. And then, you know, my real kind of fascination with this that I don't think we talk about enough now is, could we do, whether it's psychotropic medications, but that may be too extreme in some of the ways I think, but just things like, you know, different sort of supplements, uh, DHA, for example, that helps prefrontal cortex functioning. I think anti-inflammatory, again, not prescription-based stuff, but we know sort of the first steps in a healthy brain functioning, and yet I've not yet heard of anybody giving the DHA out or a Timeric, I can never pronounce that word, but we've got these great anti-inflammatories and we know we're learning a lot of mental health things are coming out of the inflammation of the brain. So if you take that, then if we can connect the, the connectome thing and understand brain functioning and then support people with, if nothing else, supplements and diets in extreme situations, maybe, maybe something heavier. Um, I don't know. I, I just think as we get to work with the brain in a different way, we may speed up and facilitate healing and our effectiveness by leaps and bounds. Um, I, the, the brain's still gonna change unless I'm missing something at a slow rate because there's epigenetics going on in there. Um, but that, and then I saw something, uh, what was I watching? Oh, John Oliver, I, I'm catching up on my uh, TV and the CRISPR technology when we talk <laughs> about DNA expression. It's like, you know, we're, you can buy a home kit for CRISPR. I wouldn't suggest it to anybody to do it at this point. But, you know, we, we could, I think, really help facilitate the healing process, um, which obviously maybe if we put somebody in a great living situation and create the environment, connect them with great relationships, and then supplement that with all this technology. I think there's some, I don't know, I, I think psychology, behavioralism, all of our kind of medical care, you know, you see these kind of big breakthroughs that, that can potentially happen. And I think it'll be an exciting, the, the last 20 years have been amazing to be a part of, so. 
can't yeah. imagine how, where we'll be in 20. Imagine what episode 4,000 will be. <laughs> <laughs> well, my, my, I think my, my sincere hope for getting that like better information wherever we go, right? Whatever kind of yeah. format we get it in is that it does lead us to more integrated care and more integrated approaches. I think that's really important. And the better information we get, I hope that we can do that a little bit better. Yeah, and I, I, I hope that we, again, find ways, because we know things like that Housing First program where we actually get people into safe, stable housing works, yet we haven't been able to get that into the consciousness of our communities yet. So that's where I think a lot of this best practice and quality stuff comes in is sometimes we need resources to look a little different to get the long-term payoffs. And yeah, that's hopefully once we get those connectomes up, uh, mm -hmm. we, we can uh, really then take the hardcore data, bore people to death to give us the right kind of funding <laughs> um, to, to make real difference. So, well, this has been fun. And, and Kurt, I wanted to throw out, uh, what about talking about some of the, the, the heart rate stuff for our next episode? I think that would be really... I know that's when, when, when I uh, started to have my professional crush on you, at least, is when you and Jared were talking about uh, some of the polyvagal theory, and then I had to read the book, and yeah, the crush was broken. Uh, that was amazing, <laughs> isn't it? Oh, my goodness. But, but I, think, I think to talk about what resources and, and the innovation that you've been doing, I think would be a great, great episode, because again, we know that that those systems are highly impacted by trauma i think there's a lot we yeah, could yeah. we could learn there and nerd out about as well yeah it'd be really cool all right so episode 44 next week we'll talk about uh some of the great uh stuff that that kurt's been doing we'll, we'll probably mention the poly, am i saying that polyvagal theory polyvagal polyvagal guy and you pick up the book and it's so good and yet <laughs> you, yeah I, I just I, I, that's why I need to hear it from you uh, instead of trying to read that sucker again. I have to but take it in doses. Absolutely. So we'll, we'll get Jerry's take on that too. So uh, join us next week. Uh, Kurt, thanks a lot. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. I knew this was going to be a fun conversation. Um, and uh, you can always, as always, find show notes. We put discussion questions up, videos, links, all that stuff at uh, traumainformedlens.org. And uh, We'll see you next week. Thanks, Kurt. Bye.